All right, welcome back to another episode of Mike Reads. Today we'll be continuing in our series on Adam Smith's The Wealth of Nations with our third read in Book 4, Chapter 5, entitled Of Bounties. This section will begin the subsection entitled Digression Concerning the Corn Trade and Corn Laws. So without further ado, Digression Concerning the Corn Trade and Corn Laws. I cannot conclude this chapter concerning bounties without observing that the praises which have been bestowed upon the law which establishes the bounty upon the exportation of corn and upon that system of regulations which is connected with it are altogether unmerited. A particular examination of the nature of the corn trade and of the principal British laws which relate to it will sufficiently demonstrate the truth of this assertion. The great importance of this subject must justify the length of the digression. The trade of the corn merchant is composed of four different branches, which, though they may sometimes be all carried on by the same person, are in their own nature four separate and distinct trades. These are, first, the trade of the inland dealer, secondly, that of the merchant importer for home consumption, thirdly, that of the merchant exporter of home produce for foreign consumption, and, fourthly, that of the merchant carrier, or of the importer of corn in order to export it again. 1. The interest of the, home, the, interest of the inland dealer, and that of the great body of the people, how opposite soever they may at first sight appear, are, even in years of the greatest scarcity, exactly the same. It is his interest to raise the price of his corn as high as the real scarcity of the season requires, and it can never be his interest to raise it higher. By raising the price he discourages the consumption and puts everybody more or less, but particularly the inferior ranks of people, upon thrift and good management. If, by raising it too high, he discourages the consumption so much that the supply of the season is likely to go beyond the consumption of the season, and to last for some time after the next crop begins to come in, he runs the hazard not only of losing a considerable part of his corn by natural causes, but of being obliged to sell what remains of it for much less than what he might have had for it several months before. If by not raising the price high enough he discourages the consumption so little that the supply of the season is likely to fall short of the consumption of the season, he not only loses a part of the profit which he might otherwise have made, but he exposes the people to suffer before the end of the season instead of the hardships of a de- uh, instead of the hardships of a dearth the dreadful horrors of a famine it is the interest of the people that their daily weekly and monthly consumption should be proportioned as exactly as possible to the supply of the season the interest of the inland corn dealer is the same by supplying them as nearly as he can judge in this proportion he is likely to sell all his corn for the highest price and with the greatest profit. And his knowledge of the sale of the state of the crop and of his daily, weekly, and monthly sales enable him to judge, with more or less accuracy, how far they really are supplied in this manner. Without intending the interest of the people, he is necessarily led, by regard to his own interest, to treat them, even in years of scarcity, pretty much in the same manner as the prudent master of a vessel is sometimes obliged to treat his crew. When he foresees the provisions are likely to run short, he puts them upon short allowance. Though from excess of caution he should sometimes do this without any real necessity, yet all the inconveniencies which his crew can thereby suffer are inconsiderable in comparison of the danger, misery, and ruin to which they might sometimes be exposed by less provident conduct, by less provident conduct. Though from excess of avarice, in the same manner, the inland corn merchant should sometimes raise the prices of his corn somewhat higher than the scarcity of the season requires, yet all the inconveniencies which the people can suffer from this conduct, which effectually secures them from a famine in the end of the season, are inconsiderable in comparison of what they might have been exposed to by a more liberal way of dealing in the beginning of it. The corn merchant himself is likely to suffer the most by this excess of avarice, not only from the indignation which it generally excites him against him, 
But though he should escape the effects of this indignation, from the quantity of corn which it necessarily leaves upon his hands in the end of the season, and which, if the next season happens to prove favorable, he must always sell for a much lower price than he might otherwise have had. Were it possible, indeed, for one great company of merchants to possess themselves of the whole crop of an extensive country, it might, perhaps, be their interest to deal with it as the Dutch are said to do with the spiceries of the Moluccas, Moluccas, to destroy or throw away a considerable part of it in order to keep up the price of the rest. But it is scarce possible, even by the violence of law, to establish such an extensive monopoly with regard to corn. And wherever the law leaves the trade free, it is of all commodities the least liable to be engrossed or monopolized by the force of a few large capitals, which buy, it up, which buy up the greater part of it. Not only its value far purchasing, not only its value far exceeds what the capitals of a few private men are capable of purchasing, but supposing they were capable of purchasing it, the manner in which it is produced renders this purchase altogether impracticable. As in every civilized country it is the commodity of which the annual consumption is the greatest, so a greater quantity of industry is annually employed in producing corn than in producing any other commodity. When it first comes from the ground, too, it is necessarily divided among a greater number of owners than any other commodity. And these owners can never be collected into one place like a number of independent manufacturers, but are necessarily scattered through all the different corners of the country. These first owners either immediately supply the consumers in their own neighborhood, or they supply other inland dealers who supply those consumers. The inland dealers in corn, therefore, including both the farmer and the baker, are necessarily more numerous than the dealers in any other commodity, and their dispersed situation renders it altogether impossible for them to enter into any general combination. If in a year of scarcity, therefore, any of them should find that he had a good deal more corn upon hand than, at the current price, he could hope to dispose of before the end of the season, he would never think of keeping up this price to his own loss and to the sole benefit of his rivals and competitors, but would immediately lower it in order to get rid of his corn before the new crop began to come, up, come in. The same motives, the same interests, which would thus regulate the conduct of any one dealer, would regulate that of every other and oblige them all in general to sell their corn at a price which, according to the best of their judgment, was most suitable to the scarcity or plenty of this season. Whoever examines with, att with attention the history of the dearths and famines which have afflicted any part of Europe during either the course of the present or that of the two preceding centuries, of several of which we have pretty exact accounts, will find, I believe, that a dearth never has arisen from any combination among the inland dealers in corn nor from any other cause but a real scarcity, occasioned sometimes, perhaps, and in some particular places, by the waste of war, but in by far the greatest number of cases, by the fault of the seasons, and that a famine has never arisen from any other cause but the violence of government attempting, by improper means, to remedy the inconveniences of a dearth. In an extensive corn country, between all the different parts of which there is a free commerce and communication, the scarcity occasioned by the most unfavorable seasons can never be so great as to produce a famine. And the scantiest crop, if managed with frugality and economy, will maintain through the year the same number of people that are commonly fed in a more affluent manner by one of moderate plenty. The seasons most, most unfavorable to the crop are those of excessive drought or excessive rain. But, as corn grows equally upon high and low lands, upon grounds that are disposed to be wet, to be too wet, and upon those that are disposed to be too dry, either the drought or the rain which is hurtful to one part of the country is favorable to another. And though both in the wet and in the dry season the crop is a good deal less than one more properly tempered, yet in both what is lost in one part of the country is in some measure compensated by what is gained in the other. In rice countries, where the crop not only requires a very moist soil, 
but where in a certain period of its growing it must be laid under water, the effects of a drought are much more dismal. Even in such countries, however, the drought is, perhaps, scarce ever so universal as necessarily to occasion a famine, if the government would allow a free trade. The drought in Bengal, a few years ago, might probably have occasioned a very great dearth. Some improper regulations, some, unjust, some injudicious restraints imposed by the servants of the East India Company upon the rice trade contributed, perhaps, to turn that dearth into a famine. When the government, in order to remedy the inconveniences of dearth, orders all the dealers to sell their corn at what it supposes a reasonable price, it either hinders them from being, bringing it to market, which may sometimes produce a famine even in the beginning of the season, or if they bring it thither, it enables the people and thereby encourages them to consume it so fast as must necessarily produce a famine before the end of the season. The unlimited, unrestrained freedom of the corn trade, as it is the only effectual pre- pre- preventative of the miseries of a famine, so it is the best palliative of the inconveniencies of a dearth. For the inconveniencies of a real scarcity cannot be remedied. They can only be palliated. No trade deserves more the full protection of the law, and no trade requires it so much, because no trade is so much exposed to popular odium. In years of scarcity, the inferior ranks of people impute their distress to the avarice of the corn merchant, who becomes the object of their hatred and indignation. Instead of making profit upon such occasions, therefore, he is often in danger of being utterly ruined and of having his magazines plundered and destroyed by their violence. It is in years of scarcity, however, when prices are high, that the corn merchant expects to make his principal profit. He is generally in contract with some farmers to furnish him for a certain number of years with a certain quantity of corn at a certain price. This contract price is settled according to what is supposed to be the moderate and reasonable, that is, the ordinary or average price, which, before the late years of scarcity, was, qu- was commonly about 8 and 20 shillings for the quarter of wheat, and for that of other grain in proportion. In years of scarcity, therefore, the corn merchant buys a great part of his corn for the ordinary price and sells it for a much higher. That this extraordinary profit, however, is no more than sufficient to put his trade upon a fair level with other trades and to compensate the many losses which he sustains upon other occasions, both from the perishable nature of the commodity itself and from the frequent and unforeseen fluctuations of its price, seems evident enough from this single circumstance that great fortunes are as seldom made in this as in any other trade. The the popular odium, however, which attends it in years of scarcity, the only years in which it can be very profitable, renders people of character and fortune averse to enter into it. It is abandoned into an inferior set of dealers, and millers, bakers, mealmen, and meal factors, together with a number of wretched hucksters, are almost the only middle people that, in the home market, come between the grower and the consumer. The ancient policy of Europe, instead of, instead of discountenancing this popular odium against a trade so beneficial to the public, seems, on the contrary, to have authorized and encouraged it. By the 5th and 6th of Edward the se- the 6th, Cap 14, it was enacted that whoever should buy any of corn of grain with intent to sell it again should be reputed an unlawful engrosser and should, for the, first fault, for the first fault, suffer two months' imprisonment and forfeit the value of the corn, for the second, suffer six months' imprisonment and forfeit double the value, and for the third, be sent in the pillory, suffer imprisonment during the king's pleasure, and forfeit all his goods and chattels. The ancient policy of most other parts of Europe was no better than that of England. Our ancestors seem to have imagined that the people would buy their corn cheaper of the farmer than of the corn merchant, who, they were afraid, would require over and above the price which he paid to the farmer, an exorbitant profit to himself. 
They endeavored, therefore, to annihilate his trade altogether. They even endeavored to hinder as much as possible any middleman of any kind from coming in between the grower and the consumer. And this was the meaning of the many restraints which they imposed upon the trade of those whom they called kidders or carriers of corn, a trade which nobody was allowed to exercise without a license ascertaining his qualifications as a man of probity and fair dealing. The authority of three justices of the peace was, by the statute of Edward VI, necessary in order to grant this license. But even this restraint was afterwards, though thought insufficient, and by a statute of Elizabeth, the privilege of granting it was confined to the quarter sessions. The ancient policy of Europe endeavored in this manner to regulate agriculture, the great trade of the country, by maxims quite different from those which it established with regard to manufacturers, the great trade of the towns. By leaving the farmer no other customers but either the consumers or their immediate factors, the kidders and carriers of corn, it endeavored to force him to exercise the trade, not only of a farmer, but of a corn merchant or corn retailer. On the contrary, it, it in many cases prohibited the manufacturer from exercising the trade of a shopkeeper or from selling his own goods by retail. It meant by the one law to promote the general interest of the country or to render corn cheap without, perhaps, its being well understood how this was to be done. By the other, it meant to promote that of a particular order of men, the shopkeepers, who would be so much undersold by the manufacturer, it was supposed, that their trade would be ruined if he was allowed to retail at all. The manufacturer, however, though he had been allowed to keep a shop and to sell his own goods by retail, could not have undersold the common shopkeeper. Whatever part of his capital he might have placed in his shop, he must have withdrawn it from his manufacturer. In order to carry on his business on a level with that of other people, as he must have had the profit of a manufacturer on the, on the one part, so he must have had that of a shopkeeper upon the other. Let us suppose, for example, that in the particular town where he lived, 10% was the ordinary profit both of manufacturing and shopkeeping stock. He must in this case have charged upon every piece of his own goods, which he sold in his shop, a profit of 20%. When he carried them from his workhouse to the shop, he must have valued them at a price for which he could have sold them to a dealer or shopkeeper who would have bought them by wholesale. If he valued them lower, he lost a part of the profit of his manufacturing capital. When again he sold them from his shop, unless he got the same price at which his shopkeeper would have sold them, he lost a part of the profit of his shopkeeping capital. Though he might appear, therefore, to make a double profit upon the same price of goods, yet as these goods made successively a par part of two distinct capitals, he made but a single profit upon the whole capital employed about them, and if he made less than this profit, he was a loser, or did not employ his whole capital with the same advantage as the greater part of his neighbors. What the manufacturer was prohibited to do, the farmer was in some measure enjoined to do to divide his capital between two different employments, to keep one part of it in his granaries and, sta and stackyard for supplying the occasional demands of the market, and to employ the other in the cultivation of his land. But as he could not afford to employ the latter for less than the ordinary profits of farming stock, so he could as little afford to employ the former for less than the ordinary profits of mercantile stock. Whether the stock which really carried on the business of the corn merchant belonged to the person who was called a farmer or to the person who was called a corn merchant, an equal profit was in both cases requisite in order to indemnify its owner for employing it in this manner, in order to put his business upon a level with other trades, and in order to hinder him from having an interest to change it as soon as possible for some other. The farmer, therefore, who was thus forced to exercise the trade of a corn merchant, could not afford to sell his corn cheaper than any other corn merchant would have been, a, been obliged to do in the case of a free competition. The dealer who can employ his whole stock in one single branch of business has an advantage of the same kind with the workman who, who can employ his whole labor in one single operation. 
As the, light, as the latter acquires a dexterity which enables him, with the same two hands, to perform a much greater quantity of work, so the former acquires so easy and ready a method of transacting his business, of buying and disposing of his goods, that with the same capital he can transact a much greater quantity of business. As the one can commonly afford his work a good deal cheaper, so the other can commonly afford his goods somewhat cheaper than if his stock and attention were both employed about a greater variety of objects. The greater part of manufacturers could not afford to retail their own goods so cheap as a vigilant and active shopkeeper, whose sole business it was to buy them by wholesale and to retail them again. The greater part of farmers could still less afford to retail their own corn, to supply the inhabitants of a town at perhaps four or five miles distance from the greater part of them, so cheap as a vigilant and active corn merchant, whose sole business it was to purchase corn by wholesale, to collect it into a great magazine, and to retail it again. The law which prohibited the manufacturer from exercising the trade of a shopkeeper endeavored to force this division in the employment of stock to go on faster than it might otherwise have done. The law which obliged the farmer to exercise the trade of a corn merchant endeavored him to hinder it from going on so fast. Both laws were evident violations of natural liberty, and therefore unjust, and they were both, too, as impolitic as they were unjust. It is the interest of every society that things of this kind should never either be forced or obstructed. The man who employs either his labor or his stock in a greater variety of ways than his situation renders necessary can never hurt his neighbor by underselling him. He may hurt himself, and he generally does so. Jack of all trades will never be rich, says the proverb. But the law ought to always but the law ought always to trust people with the care of their own interest, as in their local situations they must generally be able to judge better of it than the legislator can do. The law, however, which obliged the farmer to exercise the trade of a corn merchant, was by far the most pernicious of the two. It obstructed not only that division in the employment of stock which is so advantageous to every society, but it obstructed the likewise but it obstructed likewise the improvement and cultivation of the land. By obliging the farmer to carry on two trades instead of one, it forced him to divide his capital into two parts, of which one only could be employed in cultivation. But if he had been at liberty to sell his whole crop to a corn merchant as fast as he could thresh it out, his whole capital might have returned immediately to the land, and have been employed in buying more cattle, and hiring more servants, in order to improve and cultivate it better. But by being obliged to sell his corn by retail, he was obliged to keep a great part of his capital in his granaries and stockyard through the year, and could not, therefore, cultivate it so well as with the same capital he might otherwise have done. This law, therefore, necessarily obstructed the improvement of the land, and, instead of tending to render corn cheaper, must have tended to render it scarcer, and therefore dearer, than it otherwise than it would otherwise have been. Okay, that seems like a good stopping point for this subsection, which is kind of long. So uh, we'll go ahead and stop there. Uh, and we will continue in our read on chapter 5 um, in, in our next read. Uh, so until then, this has been Mike signing off.